Okay, everyone, let's get started. So welcome to CS685, Advanced NLP. Uh, I'm Mohit, and I'm going to be your instructor for this semester. Um, so this class is actually sp split into two sections. We have the majority of you who are signed up in person, and about 15 or 20 of you who are taking the online version. So. Um, for all of you, you are free to watch these lectures on YouTube. They are being streamed uh, right now. Um, and someone nicely commented that this is the greatest NLP course on the whole internet. Um, so thank you. I did not pay for this person to come in here and say this, but that's uh, very nice of you. All right, so today we will just uh, do a quick intro on the, all the admin stuff, like grading, what assignments to expect, important dates. Um, we'll do a bit of a high-level overview of some of the topics that we'll cover in this class. Uh, and then we'll play around with some demos at the end. So nothing too uh, high pressure today. Uh, on Wednesday, we will start the first real topic of the semester, which is language models, which is actually basically the main topic of the entire semester as well. All right, so let's get started. Um, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, you can come to class or you can uh, join on YouTube. These are live streamed, but if you can't make the time, you can also watch them at w whenever you want. Uh, they'll be at the same YouTube links that are posted on the course website. Um, there usually is a weekly quiz. Uh, it's not graded for correctness. It's more for completion. Uh, you will submit it on Gradescope. Uh, usually it's just a bunch of short exercises uh, that test your understanding of the week's material. Um, and yes, as I alluded to, we will be using Gradescope for all submissions. Everyone here should have been uh, enrolled automatically in Piazza, Gradescope, and Canvas. Uh, if you are not in at least Piazza and Gradescope, these are the most important things. Uh, please email the instructor's account and we will um, get you enrolled. All right, so who are the instructors other than me? Um, we have four TAs for this class. Uh, three of them are my own PhD students, so Cho, Yekyung, and Catherine. Um, and the roles of the TAs are essentially to hold office hours. Uh, all five of us will have one office hour a week. So we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday all covered. So whatever day is best for you. And if you have any questions, um, you can come talk to us. Uh, there are no office hours for this first week. You shouldn't need to um, get any help this first week. Um, OK, so what happens if you want to contact the instructors about anything? Uh, please use this email address here for all course-related contact. Um, if you email one of our private accounts, uh, we probably won't respond. Um, obviously, if you have some sensitive personal matters, feel free to email me directly. But otherwise, I'm very bad at answering my own email. And if you send me an email, um, yeah, good luck. All right. Uh, oh, I see there's a question. Is this for just beginners or anyone can join? Oh, I will cover that in, in a bit. Um, there are no prerequisites, but uh, if you don't have background knowledge of a couple of key topics, you should work um, outside of class to get that background knowledge so you're not uh, left behind. Because we will move quite fast, especially in this first month, to get to a point where we are covering some of the state-of-the-art developments in the field. All right, so these office hours, uh, all of these times and locations are listed on the course website. Uh, the Zoom links will be, uh, or currently are, posted in Piazza, so um, uh, please don't share them outside of this class, but uh, the, the office hours will be held in a hybrid fashion, so uh, you can either come to these specific locations or uh, join the Zoom during this hour block. Uh, the TAs and I will monitor the Zoom and. Um, you know, it's kind of awkward to have like people on Zoom and people in person, but we'll try and do our best to address everyone's questions uh, so you're not waiting too long. Um, 
when we have homeworks or exams due uh, uh, that week, we may elect to extend the office hours as needed, um, depending on how many people are trying to ask questions. And again, no office hours for this week. Okay, so uh, if you are not enrolled in the class and are trying to get into the class, um, I can't help you, none of the TAs can help you. Uh, please uh, email the admins um, or go to the CS office, uh, submit your override requests. Um, but uh, yeah, this class has completely filled up, as you can see, this room. Only the least desirable seats are free. Um, so. Uh, if you are on the wait list and you have a very late position there, uh, it's unlikely that you'll be able to um, uh, enroll in the class. And the add drop stuff is, is there in case you care about that. All right, uh, so we have many ways of, uh, if you want to give us feedback on anything regarding the pacing, material, assignment too hard, assignment too easy, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can either post them anonymously on Piazza. Uh, a lot of people don't like to or don't feel a need to use Piazza, so you can also submit uh, comments to this anonymous Google form. Um, I say we will go over some or all submitted responses at the start of every class. Historically, I don't do this, so um, if you have something really important, I will. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, you're basically best served to post things on Piazza. Um, that's uh, also the platform that all of the TAs and I will be consistently monitoring. All right, so um, what kind of prior knowledge is needed? Um, obviously knowing how to program is, is critical. Uh, all of the assignments other than the very first one will have some sort of programming component. Um, uh, specifically in Python, uh, so uh, definitely if you don't know how to program in Python, you should learn on your own. Um, there are no official prerequisites, but again, if you have some basic knowledge of machine learning, probability, stats, uh, calculus, these are all important for many of the topics we'll be covering here. Um, okay, so this is also a project-based class. Uh, a lot of your grade, I think 40%, is associated with the final project. Um, this is because NLP is a very applied field, right? So, um, you know, most of the students learn the most from this class by working intensively on their final project, which is a topic of your choosing. So due to the huge size of this class, um, we are restricting the project groups to be of uh, size four or five students. So um, at this week, we will post some stuff on Piazza to help you organize into final project groups. Um, you can either choose your group of four or five, or if you don't want to, we will randomly assign you to a group uh, in about two weeks. So um, yeah. All right, will we have notes? Um, so slides like this particular uh, deck of slides will be posted before the lecture on the course website. Um, sometimes I will use the iPad to write things instead of using slides. Um, those notes will be posted after the, the lecture. All right. Oh, I did have a slide on the prereqs. Uh, I think we went over most of this. Uh, we will be using PyTorch, which is a deep learning library that's commonly used to build um, open source language models, which we'll discuss later this week. Um, and yeah, again, please brush up on all of these things if you're not familiar with them. The first homework, which has been released, is basically a refresher on many of these topics. Uh, and it will also force you to read at least one research paper in NLP and come up with a list of all the things you couldn't understand from that paper. The goal is by the end of this class, the, the semester, you will be able to read such papers and understand most of what is going on. Probably not everything because, you know, even uh, experts in this field can't properly understand these papers completely, but uh, you'll have uh, most of the background knowledge needed. 
All right, so grading. Um, I mentioned these weekly quizzes that are graded uh, just for completion, not for correctness. These will account for 5% of your total grade. You will have either three or four homework assignments, depending on um, uh, yeah, what I decide regarding the topic of the last homework assignment. Um, they will involve both written and programming portions, other than this first uh, homework. Um, you will have an exam. Uh, unlike previous semesters, this exam will be in this class and it will be handwritten. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a change. Last In the previous semesters after COVID, we used to have a remote take-home exam and give people like two days to do it, but uh, we had a big cheating scandal last semester and so you, you all get, the, um, get to go back to in-person exams as a result. On the bright side, this exam will probably be easier than the take-home exams where you know, I had to like adversarially write these questions such that ChatGPT couldn't solve them. Um, so this time, hopefully it is uh, yeah, not like that. All right, and as you can see from this, the bulk of your grade is from these final projects. So the project proposal is due in a little over a month. So this means you will form your team and you will write up an idea that you might have. I totally understand that even after a month, you will not have that many good ideas on what this field actually is or what are interesting problems. But it is an exercise to get you started thinking about your project uh, early on in the semester. We give written feedback for each group's uh, proposal and um, final project report. But um, yeah, if your project idea that you propose is totally ludicrous or you can only do it if you have millions of dollars in GPUs or something like that, it's good to get the feedback very early on. Um, so that's the point of the proposal. Uh, your ideas can change between the proposal and the report, but you will have to justify uh, those changes to us. And so a bit about the organization of this project. Um, so there's five instructors. Each of you will be assigned one of the instructors as kind of a mentor for your project. And uh, that instructor is responsible for knowing a little more detail about your project than the other TAs. However, you can go to any of our office hours to get feedback, but um, as far as the person like you know, reading your proposal in detail and giving you detailed feedback, there will be one uh, contact. So you, you can go to that person anytime during the semester for help and advice on, on your project. All right, any questions so far? Sorry. Great. Okay, so extra credit. Um, so I was thinking since you all will have to be forced to take this in-class exam, which no one wants to do, uh, I'll also provide more extra credit this um, semester to make up for it. So in particular, we have this semester an NLP seminar. It takes place every Wednesday morning on Zoom. And um, you are free to attend any of these talks via the Zoom link. It'll be posted in Piazza. Uh, every week. Uh, it's not happening this week, but I think we'll start next week. Um, so if you attend uh, this talk, you can uh, complete a quick write-up on the talk. We'll give you a template on how to fill that out. Um, and you can earn extra credit this way. You can um, attend up to five of these to earn um, as much extra credit as you can up to a cap of 3%. I might increase this depending on the exam average score. All right, and you can see the schedule here. Uh, again, these slides are posted to the course webpage, so uh, no need to write this down. Okay, um, regarding readings, there are no textbooks that you need to buy. Um, readings will generally be provided as PDF links on the website. Um, and they will usually be NLP research papers or tutorials, sometimes blogs, things like that. Uh, this is a very fast moving field, so any textbook that has been written is already outdated by a 
you know, sometimes a huge margin. So uh, the field really moves in terms of these short uh, conference papers or preprints that are posted online every day and every week. Um, I've taught this class a bunch. The previous videos and materials for all of the previous semesters are available um, online. Uh, you are free to use any of these materials to study for, say, the exam or get ideas for the final project. Um, this course will have quite a bit of overlap with the last year's version, obviously. However, um, a significant amount of stuff has changed and improved since the last time I taught this course. Um, I think in spring 2023, ChatGPT had just come out, um, and so uh, we kind of built up to understanding how it works. Um, this semester, there hasn't been any like, you know, huge advance like ChatGPT compared to the previous year, but still these models have improved a huge amount in just the span of a year. So we'll be talking about some of those advances and how they've made language technology more capable. Um, and really the point of this class is to get to the state of the art and uh, learn like what people are currently doing now to further improve the capabilities of these models. All right, any questions about all this admin stuff? Anyone on YouTube? I forgot to mention, or maybe I did, that if you have any questions and you're online for all, well, 33 of you, um, please feel free to write your questions in the chat. Um, and I do read these. Oh, okay, great. For those of us who are online only students, how will the midterm exam work? Yeah, that's a, a good point. I will post something um, or send an email to all of you closer to the exam date. But basically, um, we will offer a couple slots on where you will take the exam, probably put like a camera, your Zoom camera on. You'll have the same time block, and a TA will um, monitor through Zoom. Um, but more details on that to follow. It'll likely be on the day of the in-person class exam as well. OK, no questions so far. Great. Uh, so let's start with the topic of this whole class. What is natural language processing? Uh, first thing we should do is probably define what a natural language is, right? So these are languages that evolve naturally through human use. Um, you know, so English, Hindi, Spanish, these kinds of languages. Um, whoops, we aren't going to be talking so much about other types of languages, but um, there may be a lecture later on about uh, code, like programming languages. You can apply m most of the technologies that we're going to be talking about here to generating and understanding code as well. Um, and of course, like there's many other applications of these models. Uh, we may also cover um, visual understanding models as well in, in a lecture. There's um, kind of been a unification of all of these models that process images, videos, text, uh, and audio into a general class of models. So we might cover some of these multimodal applications um, in, in a separate lecture. But the main focus of uh, this class is on text. All right, so what does processing mean? Um, again, broadly, the goal is to use computer programs to understand and generate um, natural language, right? So there's many different forms of this. Um, a very common paradigm is supervised learning, where you might have some labeled data, right? Like I have an Amazon review and I have a score of that review. Uh, I think it's like uh, one to five stars, right? And your goal is to learn a mapping function between the input and the labels. Um, and so there's many different ways to do this, uh, different models, different training objectives, and so on. Um, there's also unsupervised cases where you don't have any labels and maybe your goal is to 
learn something about a collection of texts. So in this realm, you might have um, paradigms like topic models that do some sort of clustering on your data. And you can look at it and learn something about the composition of the data. Like maybe I have a lot of sports documents in this collection and not a lot of news documents or something. Um, sadly, we will not be talking about topic models in this class, but uh, it is one example of uh, unsupervised algorithm. Mostly, we will focus on generating text, um, which does kind of subsume the supervised learning paradigm, and there's many other types of interesting methods that uh, you can use to improve the generation of text. But you can imagine if I had, say, that same problem that I was talking about, given an Amazon review predicted score, this can actually be turned into a text generation task, right? So I could say, um, here's a text of my review. Please give me a score from one to five. What do you think the sentiment of this review is, right? So those of you who have used ChatGPT or something like that, which I assume is almost all of you. Has anyone here not used a large language model? Wow. I think I asked the same question last year and there were like maybe a third of the class that had not, but uh, well, how things have changed. Um, so obviously this is familiar to, to most of you, right? You prompt the model, you ask it in natural language, what is the instruction that you want it to follow? And it generates text that hopefully follows that instruction. And so a lot of NLP research now is focused on the problem of making a language model better follow instructions, more complicated instructions, longer instructions, um, and things like this. So um, that's probably what we will be focusing on for most of the, uh, the semester. Um, it's certainly useful to know what a language is made up of. Um, so this slide is basically just showing, with a simple sentence, Alice talked to Bob, the different levels of linguistic structure that are present here. So we can start at the character level, right? There's obviously different letters that make up the sentence. And in fact, many of the language models we see today don't even operate at the character level. They actually operate at an even lower level of byte, byte level encoding, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, right now. Um, and then you have, you know, the formation of different words using subwords, right? So here you have the word talked, right, which has the stem verb talk, which contains the meaning of the utterance. Um, and then you also have this suffix, right, ed, which indicates that this happened in the past, right? This is a past tense verb. You can form words out of these kinds of subwords. Uh, you can use syntax, so the rules of the language, the grammatical rules that tell you, you know, how a noun and a verb should be merged together in order to, um, you know, create some sort of constituent um, to help you. So there are different levels of syntax. Here I've shown you parts of speech, right? So talked is a past tense verb, to is a preposition. There's also this kind of hierarchical structure, right? So uh, Alice is a noun that forms a noun phrase. It combines with this verb phrase, talk to Bob. When you combine these using the grammatical rules of English, you can form a valid sentence, right? And so many NLP classes, including the ones I taught five, six years ago, focused heavily on how do you obtain these kinds of trees from um, text, right? And this is a useful endeavor if you are, say, trying to use this kind of structure as features for some sort of classification model um, or a translation model or something like that. However, nowadays I might have one lecture on this kind of syntactic parsing, but re really it's not as useful anymore as it once was when you have these huge language models that have implicitly learned a lot of these syntactic rules just from their uh, training data and training objectives. However, I should mention that the algorithms for doing syntactic parsing are very cool and very interesting. And if you do have any interest in this, uh, please check out 
um, the textbook that's linked on the website. Also, my colleague Brendan teaches the undergrad NLP class, which I think has a much larger focus on syntax and has some materials and slides that you can um, use there. All right, and then what happens above this? Um, we have the actual meaning of the sentence, right? So what does Alice talk to Bob mean? Well, Alice is an agent. Bob is the recipient of this message, right? There's some context uh, surrounding this. We can have some sort of formal representation of all the different roles that these words can take in the sentence and how they combine together to form some uh, understandable meaning. Um, beyond this, you have discourse structure, right? So Alice talked to Bob is one sentence. What happens when you pair it with uh, a much larger context? Alice talked to Bob, they went to class, uh, they fell asleep, right? This is a three-sentence three story. It uh, tells you a bit of information in each sentence. So what is happening across multiple sentences? That's when we're talking about discourse. So each of these are very well-studied areas in their own right. Um, and it's good for you to know like this, this full hierarchy and be uh, at least aware of the terms that, that we're talking about here. All right, um, so let's just get into some, some of the paradigms, the learning paradigms that we will talk about in this uh, semester. Uh, I already mentioned supervised learning. Here is an example. Given a collection of 20,000 movie reviews, train a machine learning model to map the text of the review to the score of the review. This is a task called sentiment analysis. Um, it's also an example of a uh, text classification task. So text classification is um, you know, certainly one of the dominant examples of supervised learning. Um, however, more uh, recently, there have been uh, critical developments in what's called self-supervised learning. So conceptually, this is similar to supervised learning. You have some input. You have a label, and you want to um, you know, train a model to predict that label given the text. However, what is the difference is in the source of the labels. So in this example, if I am Amazon, I have access to all these reviews, and I have access to the human written review text and scores. Right. So some human has provided me with these labels. In self-supervised learning, I get the labels for free. So the uh, dominant example of self-supervised learning in NLP is the task of language modeling, which you all have used uh, clearly with ChatGPT, right? So in language modeling, the task is given a piece of text, predict the next word that follows this piece of text. So you can see that this is a text classification problem, right? It's a prediction problem where your labels are all possible words in the vocabulary of the language. But the difference is that I get the labels for free, right? If I have a piece of text, I can just convert it into many instances of this uh, language modeling problem. I can chop that text at any point in the text and say, this is my input, whatever happened to the left. And the word that occurs on the right of where I uh, chop this text is my label. So in this way, I can use every piece of written text I can find on the internet, I can you know, scan some books, whatever, I can use it to train a model for this task of language modeling. And that is exactly what uh, ChatGPT is based on. Um, just the simple task of predicting the next word, except you're given trillions of examples of this is the input, and this is the word that follows. And it turns out you can learn a huge amount of information about a natural language by simply scaling up this uh, simple task. All right, so uh, I guess I answered my own question. We can gather basically infinite data for these kinds of tasks. The, the labels come for free because they just exist by you know, cropping different pieces of text at different points. Any questions? I see one on uh, YouTube. Has topic modeling been subsumed under the LLM plus prompting paradigm, or is it more separate? Do methods like LDA still hold up? 
Uh, yes, methods such as LDA, which is uh, probably the main uh, algorithm used for topic modeling, are still the standard today. They're very fast, they're efficient, and have been shown to, uh, to be very useful for humans. Um, but there are uh, variants of topic models that use uh, large language models, including one from my uh, own group recently. But of course, they're still uh, much more expensive and there needs to be more work done. But um, anyway, we can talk about that later. All right, let's move on to a different learning paradigm, which is transfer learning. So transfer learning combines what we just talked about in self-supervised learning, where I have this simple task of language modeling, I've scaled it up to as many words, as many pieces of text as I could get, and I've trained a large model to do this task of predicting the next word. Now, I want to use this model to improve my performance on a specific task that I care about. So let's say my task is still sentiment analysis. I want to take a, pe uh, a review of a movie and predict the score of that movie. In this method, I would train a model from scratch on just the labeled data that I've collected from the humans that have been watching these movies and labeling them. In this approach, I still have that collection of human uh, labeled data, but I'm not starting from scratch anymore. I start with the pre-trained, self-supervised model that has been trained to predict the next word, and I do what's called fine-tuning, where I adjust the pre-trained model such that it achieves a low loss on the sentiment uh, task, where I'm trying to predict the movie reviews. So uh, intuitively, why do you think that this approach might be better than this first uh, supervised learning from scratch a model approach? Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah, so um, the answer you gave was we have a lot more data on a more generic task, and um, we're not just limited to the small amount of label data that we have. Uh, let's delve a little deeper into that answer. So it's clear that predicting the next word of a piece of text is a more generic task than predicting the label of a movie review. Why would we think that the first task could actually help the second task? Any ideas? Yeah, so uh, I think what you said was uh, the first task, the generic task, allows us to learn a lot of fundamental concepts about the language, right? Maybe we learn the semantics of what bad means versus good by, uh, let's say I had a, a text like, this movie was so horrible, I couldn't even watch it, I walked out of the theater, I give it a score of blank, right? And the first, the pre-trained model here, what would it predict, right? It probably wouldn't say 10 out of 10, right? That doesn't make sense in the context. If it were trained properly, it might give you a low score, right? And there you already have an example of sentiment analysis that's been kind of put into this uh, paradigm of predicting the next word, language modeling. So yeah, the first task, but both of you are correct, is generic, but it's also easy to see how things that are learned during this um, pre-training task can transfer over the skills that are learned, right? You learn all these things about semantics, about syntax, you learn idioms, cultural uh, references, things that you might see in these movie reviews that could help you solve the task. So if you start in this paradigm, the model knows nothing about language and has to learn everything it knows about language from 20,000 movie reviews, right? It's just not enough data to be able to generalize effectively to new texts. Uh, there's a question, did the output type of the model change when doing that transfer? Uh, this is a good question. Um, it, it, is, uh, it can change sometimes, and 
Uh, nowadays, it often does not change. So uh, here, if you wanted to do sentiment analysis, you would still have the model predict the words of the label. Like you might say, the score was 5 out of 10. Each token is being generated by a language model. But before this, uh, the output type could change. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more extensively later in this semester. All right, and then the newest form of this kind of, uh, of these learning paradigms is called in-context learning. So in what I talked about here with transfer learning, we are doing two stages of training. We have our self-supervised pre-training. We're calling it pre-training because this is the main thing we're doing before specializing our model to solving the new task. Um, but then we're also doing the second stage of training, which is called fine-tuning which happens on a much smaller data set that consists of examples of the task that we actually care about solving. In in-context learning, we just use a pre-trained model. Um, it is not fine-tuned on any examples of the task that you're, you, you care about. However, you are prompting this model with natural language in order to solve the task. So here, I pre-trained a large language model, let's say on hundreds of billions of words, and then I feed as input, what is the sentiment of this sentence? Insert the sentence, I might say the score is blank, and the model will just predict the next word and give me the score. And I can, there are many variants on this uh, paradigm. Uh, if you've heard of the phrase prompt engineering, Right? There's many ways you can kind of coax the model to do what you're trying to tell it to do. You can put examples of the task you want to solve into the context. Um, you can say, explain your thought process or something like that. Um, you can even do dumb things like say, let's uh, take a deep breath and then solve this, uh, this problem and it seems to help. So, um, you know. This is uh, pretty new, but uh, it's also going to be the main focus of our semester. Like, how do we get models that are capable of this? And how do we improve this uh, ability? All right, so let's uh, try some of these models out. Um, I usually have done this before using OpenAI's API, but uh, this semester I wanted to kind of prioritize these um, open source uh, language models, so the capabilities of these models has been, have been improving rapidly. Um, so now that I've talked about some of these concepts, uh, let's just see if um, uh, a language model has the same ability to explain some of them. So the first thing I want to ask is, what is a natural language? So I've told all of you what a natural language is. Can we get the same um, content out from a language model? If so, then you know why am I even here? You could learn this whole uh, class material from one of these language models, right? Um, so a natural language is a type of language. Maybe I'll zoom in a little. Is this readable to people in the back? Yeah. Uh, it is the primary means by which we express thoughts, emotions, and ideas. Blah, 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 it seems to be pretty decent. Um, maybe I'll ask, uh, what are the main components oh, of a natural language? Express your answer as a list. So let's see if it can do some formatting. I've given it a stylistic instruction as well as some content to produce. All right, so phonology, the study of sounds, morphology, the study of the smallest units of meaning, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, lexicon, discourse, sociolinguistics, psych psycholinguistics, uh, seems to have done a more complete job than, than I did in my slide. So um, it, it seems to be working pretty well, right, for these kinds of um, tasks. And again, this is a model that is at its core just doing this task of predicting the next word. It's been trained on, I guess the maintainers of this model have not um, released their data set, so we ha actually have no idea what it's trained on. Maybe I should switch to a model that, all right, never, never mind. Um, a more open source model is what I was uh, trying to do. Um, okay, so now, 
you know, these things are clearly very impressive, but they still have major limitations. So how many of you have tried to use ChatGPT to do something and it's just totally failed to understand what you were saying? I guess maybe a better way to ask this question is how many of you have used ChatGPT and never encountered a situation where it failed to follow what you wanted? All right, so all of you have had some experience with ChatGPT failing um, or whatever model you're using failing, right? So what are those failure cases? Where does it fail the most? Um, so we could start with, let's say, a very simple example. Um, write a story about a dog that lives in a house. So let's see what happens here. Here it's kind of hard to go wrong, right? It's clearly once upon a time there was a golden retriever named Max, blah, 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 lived in a cozy red brick house. Clearly it followed this instruction to a, to a T. So where do these models struggle? Well, there are many ways I could make this more complicated, right? I could give it a very, very long and specific instruction about this story. So maybe, um, and I actually haven't tried any of this, so I hope it breaks. <laughs> um, make sure the story is, has exactly seven paragraphs. Each paragraph should end with the word, uh, someone give me a word. Cat, okay. Let's see. All right, well it already failed on the, oh wait, never mind. What, what is this, this is, does this not count as a paragraph? It's, all right, well regardless, paragraph one as labeled by this model does not end with cat, nor does paragraph two. Paragraph three, it did produce seven paragraphs, however, it failed to follow this other instruction, right? So, I mean, you probably would never ask such an instruction and hope to get the, the right answer, but still, this demonstrates one of the issues with these models is that if you put too many constraints and conditions on the output, it fails to understand exactly what you mean. Um, all right, let's, let's look at another uh, example. So here I have the Wikipedia article of a basketball player, right? And the reason I have this is I want to show you some of the issues that happen when you ask for things that involve the real world. So here I'm just gonna say write a biography of this player, Gilbert Arenas. And it will always generate something, right? So it says, Gilbert Arenas, born on August 6, 1982 in Los Angeles, California, is a retired basketball player. Oh, why? okay. <laughs> we still have the paragraph tags. Uh, interesting. Um, but, you know, it seems quite plausible, right? It, it, looks like it, it looks like it's a real biography. Let's see if it's actually correct. Um, so here it says he's born January 6th, 1982. So it got the year right, but not the date. He was born in Tampa, Florida, not Los Angeles, California. So it got the place wrong. Um, he is indeed a retired American basketball uh, player. So it got some things right and some things wrong, um, which is you know the kind of user experience that we have now, right? Where it can follow some things, but it fails at, at other things. Um, and it's very confident, right? It didn't say, I don't know when Gilbert Arenas was born. Uh, I don't have this information. It just made up a date. And then it just confidently output that. And, you know, we can't really trust this, this output, right? And this is true of anything you use these models for. Uh, whether it's, you know, to study for this class and you look up a concept, you, you may not know if what it's saying is actually correct or not. Um, this example also uh, kind of highlights one of the potential ways to improve these models. So here, if I only had access to this Wikipedia article, I could have kind of put this information into the model, maybe into the prompt, 
and have it, uh, you know, generate stuff that uses the right uh, facts instead of making stuff up. So this is an area of research that is commonly referred to as retrieval augmented language modeling, where you have a language model that's generating one word at a time, and you pair it with a system that tries to search for information about um, certain topics. So some of you may have used um, you know, Google Bard or Perplexity AI or one of these um, you know, search uh, engines that are based on language models. All these things are doing are they take your query, so here, write a biography of Gilbert Arenas. You could put this into Google search and get a bunch of documents that are relevant to the query. You can take those documents and just stuff them into the uh, input of the language model and then ask the query and then generate some factually, uh, hopefully factually correct text. All right, so any questions on this stuff? Okay, anyone on YouTube? It seems intuitive that a fine-tuned model would do better, but um, not obvious why the pre-trained model isn't just overwritten. Um, okay, so this is an important concept. So the, the question is asking, we pre-train a large language model, but then we fine-tune it on the sentiment task. Does that mean that the model will kind of lose some of the capabilities that it had from pre-training because it's being specialized for this uh, single use case? And the answer is, in, in most cases, yes. If you do this kind of fine-tuning, the resulting model might be very, very good at the task you want to solve, but then if you try and use that model for like quest question answering or some other task, it just won't work. Um, it won't work as well as if you hadn't done this fine tuning. So there are definitely methods to get around this kind of issue, but uh, it's way too much to go into detail for this first lecture. We'll talk about it more um, in the rest of this semester. All right, so I just wanted to do one last thing. Um, so here, I've had this biography example. I wanted to highlight another issue with um, these kinds of models and their applications right now, uh, which is on the evaluation front. So here I've copied an um, instruction. As you can see, it's very long. Um, maybe I'll refresh so it doesn't do this paragraph thing. All right, so let's take a look at this example. Create a narrative exploring the journey of GLaDOS, a supercomputer, as she grapples with the complexities of human emotions, music, and the challenge of understanding sound separation with Caroline's assistance set in a pre-portal science fiction environment. And now, there's a bunch of constraints on this story. Begin the narrative with this. She should have a cynical and somewhat disdainful view of human concepts like human music and art, considering them inferior to science and logic introduce a conflict around her inability to separate sounds, blah, blah, blah. There's like, you know, 10 or 12 different constraints on the content of this story that's to be generated and the style. So here you see uh, style elements should include a mix of introspective narration, uh, dialogue that reveals character dynamics and descriptive passages. So. I can put this in to the language model, and what it's going to do is what it always does, which is just predict the next word based on what has come before, right? It doesn't have any special machinery to handle something like this compared to something like a biography. It's all the same exact model. So let me just put this in. Uh, so it made up a title, and it wrote a lot of stuff. Uh, I just capped it at 512 tokens. Um, and now, one thing we might want to do is measure, did this model actually follow the instruction that I gave it? So given this instruction and this output, uh, what do you think are some challenges with evaluating whether or not the model actually followed these instructions? Any ideas? Exactly. You have, first of all, you have just a high quantity of 
constraints that you have to check. Um, so that's definitely one one issue. Uh, what are some other issues? Yeah. That's right. So a lot of these constraints are subjective, right? So um, let's see here. Towards the end, GLaDOS should achieve a significant milestone in her quest, right? What does significant mean? It could be, um, you know, what, whatever happens in the story could be significant for someone here and not significant for me, right? So certainly the evaluation of these, uh, whether the constraint follow, is followed, could be subjective. Any other ideas? That's true. So you might have a, a large number of constraints, but if some of the constraints are related to each other in some way, that makes it even harder to check. Uh, definitely a challenge. Any other thoughts? Yeah, exactly. So the scalability of this evaluation is a huge challenge, right? So if I ask you, I have 100,000 of instructions like these and outputs like these give me a score of how well this model followed the instructions. The first thing you might think about is, um, all right, let me hire some humans maybe to read through these uh, instructions and the outputs and give a measurement of like how well the model followed the instructions. However, um, you know, how long do you think it would take a human to do this task, right? They would have to read, you know, all these instructions, as you rightly said, could have dependencies between them, read a potentially incredibly long output, and make these judgments, right? It could take hours for one of these um, examples. So what we tend to do when we have such a problem is to try and automate some of this, right? So we might want some automatic way of evaluating whether the model followed the instruction or not. However, you know, as you said, the evaluation is itself subjective. Uh, would we trust a language model to do something like this, right? What if I told this language model, I gave it the output, I gave it the instruction, and I said, did it actually follow this instruction? Would you trust the output of that model? Probably not, right? So. Um, actually, we're in this interesting phase where these models are capable of solving a huge, uh, well, not solving, but they are capable of giving you output for anything you could possibly write in text. But measuring whether or not they're actually doing what you said is very, very difficult, especially for interesting and complex tasks. And so, um, you know, quite a bit of time this semester will be spent on this evaluation problem. How are people measuring how good their language models are? Because now, you know, before, like, let's say five years ago, it was pretty easy. We didn't have these models that actually worked. And so we had all of these simple tasks like sentiment analysis. We could measure how accurate is the model at predicting the right sentiment. But now, no one is using these things for such simple tasks anymore, right? We want models that can, you know, solve your homework for you, right? Or uh, if I gave you a take-home exam, solve all those questions, right? And um, evaluating the capabilities of these models on much more complicated tasks is actually more difficult than generating outputs for those tasks in the first place. Um, so, yeah, those are some things I wanted to highlight about this uh, situation. Yes. Okay, so the, the suggestion is what if we fine tune a model to evaluate this kind of task? So, if you wanted to do that, which is a good idea, you have to have data to fine tune this language model, right? So, what does that data look like? It probably will be human written like evaluations of, okay, this constraint was followed, this constraint was not followed, something like that. But to get enough data to fine tune such a model might require a huge amount of time and money on the, to just gather the data for fine tuning. But you are correct, like that is probably how this uh, would go if, if anyone cared to evaluate this specific task. But you can imagine, you know, there's many tasks, right? This is, this is just 
a single task? What if the task looked a little different and it was like, write a biography of this person with all of these constraints? The data that you have for this task might not transfer over to the, the other task, right? So do we really want to just keep collecting expensive human annotations, or what is the best way to move forward? It's an open problem. Yeah. Yes, so um, let's say I had two humans who were annotating you know, whether or not these constraints were followed. You might expect a significant level of disagreement, right? And it gets even worse if you ask a human, did you like this story more than this story, right? That is very subjective. Um, if you assume that both of the models that produce the stories had similar um, ability to write grammatically and write coherent text, at some point it just boils down to which thing did you enjoy more, which is uh, very, very subjective, of course. So um, this is also a huge problem with the current setups for not only evaluation, but also further improving these uh, language models. All right, any other thoughts? Yeah. Ah, so that's a good question. Um, there's a concept called instruction fine-tuning or instruction tuning. Um, this uses the exact same algorithms as fine-tuning, but the goal is not to solve a single task like uh, I showed on the slides here. Um, oh, where is it? Here? So here, I had my pre-trained model and I fine-tuned it on sentiment analysis. The resulting model, as we discussed earlier, could only solve sentiment analysis and no other tasks. In instruction tuning, you are fine-tuning the model on uh, examples of instructions of arbitrary tasks. So it could be, what is the sentiment of this sentence? It could be, answer this question in five sentences. It could be, you know, like anything that I put into here. All of these, um, well, I don't know what happened to my other text, but all of these prompts that I put into this model are instructions, right? Write a biography about X. Define this concept for me. So in instruction tuning, your data set is very diverse. It contains a bunch of instructions of many different tasks along with their outputs. And the goal is not to solve any one of those tasks in particular, but rather to make the model more capable at sol uh, following instructions. So the idea is that, let's say at an instruction uh, data set of 20,000 unique instructions for different tasks, and I perform instruction tuning, if I give it a new instruction at test time that it's never seen before in its uh, instruction tuning data set, is it going to be better able to follow that instruction compared to the pre-trained model? So the goal is really to boost the model's ability to follow human written instructions, not to specialize it to any uh, task. But the method is exactly the same. So we'll talk more about that in a, its own lecture later on. Other questions? Okay, so the question is, in this, uh, maybe I'll just type it again, write a biography of Gilbert Arenas. Um, here it made up a different, actually the same date, but a different uh, city. Both of them are still wrong. Why did the model get this wrong? Um, this is a great question also, and uh, cannot really be simply answered. A lot of it is we don't know. Um, so if you think about um, a language model, we haven't got into the details of how it works, but it consists of a bunch of what are called parameters. And the intuition is that different facts about the pre-training data are somehow encoded into these parameters, which are just like real valued numbers. Um, and when the model receives an instruction, it has to be able to pull from relevant portions of these parameters to um, produce the corresponding facts that answer that instruction. And so it could be that this entity, Gilbert Arenas, 
was not well represented enough in the training data for the model to encode the exact birth date and place of birth into its parameters somewhere. And so what happens if you don't know the, the correct date? Well, you do know that if you had Gilbert Arenas born on blank, you know you're going to have to produce a date, right? Because of the uh, context that you've been provided with. If you don't know the exact date, then perhaps you would just produce whatever the most likely date the model thinks at that point is um, and produce a place as well. Uh, and so why did it produce August 6th specifically? That it's really hard to know. Maybe there's another person named Gilbert that was more represented than Gilbert Arenas and that person's birthday was on August 6th. Maybe it's an artifact of the generation process where you can see here on the right there are all these different knobs that if you mess with any of them, they control the diversity of the generation. They might uh, you know, incentivize the model to make things up more in favor of being more creative rather than um, you know, stick to what it's confident about. So uh, there are so many things that could be answers to your question that we'll cover throughout the semester, but that's just like a high level uh, overview. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can we give these models the ability to scrape or access the internet instead of just relying on their memory? Uh, yes, there's many projects that are centered around this topic. I mentioned retrieval augmented language models, there's search augmented language models. Every company that has a search engine is doing this um, right now to make their um, models able to not only access but also potentially navigate the web. Um, so you could have like an agent that um, is basically getting commands from the language model and executing those commands and returning information that is then synthesized into the answer. Um, all these are very exciting and we will cover some of them in this class. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, so if you have a model that, let's say, has access to this article, will it um, hallucinate less? Uh, we can see, right, maybe I can just do an example here. I'll just take this first paragraph and say, all right, um, here is some context, right, a full And this is exactly how most of these search augmented things work, like perplexity.ai is literally just um, pasting things into the prompt. Um, all right, let me say here's some partial context. Let's see if it gets the date right here. Yes, it does. Oh, oh wow, actually it, uh, okay, it got the place right too, but it says he was born in Tampa. Wow, so it, he, he attended high school in Los Angeles. Um, okay, so it, it fixed the date, but um, still messed up the uh, place of birth. So, um, but you can see that it can be helpful. And why is it helpful? Well, this information is now in the input to the model. And when it's predicting the next word, it's probably going to be more incentivized to predict that exact information. Right. So the question is why do models that have access to real-time search still fail to give you factually correct outputs some percentage of the time? Uh, there, there's many possible reasons as I mentioned before. There could be these kinds of hyperparameters at decoding time. There could be conflicts between the information that's received in real time and the information that's encoded in the parameters of the model that the model just doesn't know how to resolve properly. Like for example, if I uh, put in the sentence like, um, you know, Barack Obama never became the president of the United States to this model, and then I asked a question about Barack Obama, 
would it answer in a way that reflects that context I just produced? Or would it still be incentivized to produce text that, um, because it's trained on so much text that suggests that Barack Obama was a president and he did all of those things, it's just supposed to disregard all of that because of one sentence that you put in. Um, that is a kind of conflict that uh, is hard to resolve. So could be some reasons as well. All right, well, last question, if anyone has one. Okay, so, um, wow, that took way longer than I thought, but it's great that you all had lots of questions. Uh, so, what are people using large language models for? This is a um, figure from uh, a recent paper uh, that came out of this LMSYS lab from, I think, Berkeley. So they run a platform where basically you can put in a prompt, it will give you generations from two language models and you pick which one you think is better. So it's a, a real time kind of evaluation of uh, human preferences on different language models. So they uh, gathered about a million different conversations from this uh, platform and then they clustered them into different use cases. So it seems like the most common usage of these models right now is to discuss software errors and solutions. So if you're you know, using uh, Copilot or something like that, of course it's uh, incredibly useful for coding. It makes sense that this would be the number one um, use case. There's inquiries about AI tools, uh, it's kind of weird. Um, geography, travel, global cultural inquiries, so people asking questions about cultures, um, summarization, elaboration, creating and improving business strategies and products. Um, there's a surprising amount of role playing. Um, there's also this startup called Character AI that um, takes us to an extreme. Has anyone used this uh, here? Okay, uh, great. <laughs> um, it is actually quite intriguing. Like you can make uh, characters of your, or talk to characters that are, are basically just language models that act like celebrities or um, I guess the most common is like anime characters or something like that. Um, anyway, there's clearly a lot of question answering, summarization, creative content generation, um, code related stuff going on in um, the usage of these models today. And what I wanted to highlight in this slide is, uh, in case you have any prior NLP background, you'll see that a lot of these kinds of tasks are not represented by the typical NLP curriculum, like even five years ago, right? Um, so there's a lot of new ground to be covered in terms of how do we formulate these tasks, how do we evaluate them properly, and how do we improve their performance. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, just a rough list of topics. We will be mainly talking about language models. These are implemented in uh, via neural networks, so we will do some background on uh, how neural networks work, how do you implement backpropagation, which is the critical algorithm for doing this training. Uh, whenever I've been saying training a model, I mean doing backpropagation on a neural network. We will cover two broad architectures of language models. We will um, focus a little bit on recurrent neural networks and then move to the transformer, which is what is commonly used today and powers models like GPT-4. Um, in terms of tasks, we look at mainly text generation, but um, also some simpler tasks early on in the semester. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit about um, how do you gather data for many of these tasks, how do you evaluate, like we already discussed, the challenges, um, and what are the problems with these models. In terms of methods, we'll talk about things like pre-training, fine-tuning, preference tuning, which I think is like a higher level term that encompasses methods such as RLHF and DPO and things like that. These are broadly used to accomplish what people call alignment of these models to uh, human intents. And uh, of course, prompting, which all of you are familiar with. 
All right, so I think I don't want to talk too much about these final projects. What I did want to do is show some um, uh, sample, uh, samples from the last semester of successful final projects. So um, let me just go through the logistics. The first thing you have to do is form groups by February 16th, so I guess in uh, less than two weeks. Um, we will use Piazza to help facilitate the group formation. There's a thread called search for teammates. So if you have an idea for a project already, uh, you can post on there and see if other people are interested. Um, again, if you don't want to find your own group, we will assign you. So don't worry, you don't have to do anything if you don't want to. But if you have a group of people that you would like to work with, then you are free to work with those people. Um, there's only two deliverables for this project. The first is the proposal, um, which is a document, uh, at least three pages. There's a template for it. It's due in a little over a month. And the final report, which is due on the last day of classes. Um, so along with the final report, you will have to submit a reasonably well-documented code base that supports your um, project report. You can choose whatever project you want as long as it has something to do with uh, text-based data um, and it has something to do with coding as well. We don't want you to just you know, do a survey of existing approaches for something. All right, so I will skip through some of these slides. Uh, when you're coming up with your proposal, feel free to refer to these slides for some tips on what makes a good proposal. Um, I did want to get to uh, these sample projects. So these were five of the um, kind of top graded projects from last semester. I've just shown the titles. Once I get permission from the authors, I will share the actual reports also in the Piazza. But you can see that this uh, first pay, uh, project here is focused on exploring some of the reasoning abilities of vision and language models. So these might be tasks that involve like answering a question about an image or something like that. Uh, here we have an example of a more computationally social science or oriented project examining medical narratives of eating disorder recovery on Reddit. So this group used NLP technology to extract some sort of um, labels or categories of things people talk about on these kinds of Reddits and then did analysis of, you know, like how do these conversations progress on these Reddits and can you map them to uh, certain outcomes. Uh, this project was a replication project, so this is another thing you can do if you find a paper that you really like, you can just try and reproduce that uh, method that is in that paper. And it might seem easy, but it's actually very difficult to do or a successful replication. There are many aspects of these projects that are not fully specified in the paper that you'll have to figure out on your own. Um, it can be a really good exercise to do this. In some cases, you might find that the method doesn't actually work as proposed in the paper. So um, yeah, we have another, uh, this is more code-related text to SQL. So if I give you like a natural language query, can you convert it to a SQL query and execute it on a database? Um, just uh, some examples of things that you can work on. All right, and for some broader ideas, you can check out the topic list that is in the um, ACL, which is the uh, main conference of the field of NLP. Um, and there's also a new conference called Holum that is specifically about language models. So if you click this link, you can look at some of the topics that people are thinking about that are uh, specific to language models that could guide your um, research as uh, your final projects as well. Um, all right, so lastly, uh, you have a homework that has been released already, homework zero. Don't be intimidated, it's quite straightforward. I would recommend starting it early as the last question involves reading a paper and writing up a short summary, so it might take some time. Uh, oh, I should mention that for all these homeworks, um, you are free to use any sort of language model to complete them. However, 
do be warned that the exam is in person and you cannot use any of these models. So if you just use ChatGPT to complete all your homeworks this semester, you will probably fail the exam. So it is worthwhile to spend the time to actually do it yourself. Um, of course, you can uh, try and prove me wrong, which uh, is free to do. All right, so see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>